Okay, it's five o'clock. You're still settling in and that's fine. And we're waiting for one more speaker and that's fine because I know he's gonna come just in the nick of time and all will be well. Um, but I'd like to get started um, because I think we have quite a lot to talk about today and I'd be really interested in uh, your reactions and questions. So I wanna leave time in the end for you um, to voice your thoughts. Um, but let me welcome you. Um, I'm glad to see we've got such a nice uh, audience in person. And um, we have, I think, an even larger audience online. So welcome to those of you who are tuning in. Um, my name is Christine Haight Farley, and I'm a professor here. And I am one of the co-directors of our program on information justice and intellectual property law. And any day that the Supreme Court hears a case about intellectual property or technology or information law, you do not need an invitation. You just come to the law school or find our Zoom link um, and check in at 5 p.m. because we will have a panel like this. Maybe not as great as this particular panel, but an almost as good panel of experts um, speaking on the case. So what we do is we invite the litigants um, to come and participate, and today we will have one. Um, and we invite um, some of the amicus brief authors so that we can get a spectrum of views and opinions on the case. Um, and I just wanna let you know that we will have another event like this on Monday um, when the court will hear a patent case. Um, so you can check back in with us Monday at five. All right, um, so I want to very briefly introduce the panel speakers, yay Ben. Um, and um, I won't say much about them because you have a, a handout that gives their complete bios. Um, but going down the line, um, Ben Cooper from Dickstein Wright, um, he argued this morning on behalf of Respondent VIP Products. Congratulations, Ben. Um, and I really applaud you being here and being still on your feet and able to talk. So that's great. Um, we'll see how I do at the end. <laughs> <laughs> um, next, I'm delighted that we have Carrie Hefty. Um, who was recently with Wells Fargo, and she uh, submitted an amicus brief on behalf of the International Trademark Association, the INTA, in support of neither party. Um, next to me, we have Ed Colbert, who is with Hunton, Andrews, and Kurth, who wrote an amicus brief for Constellation Brands in support of Petitioner. Um, and then on my other side, we have Megan Bannigan, um, who is at Deva Voice and Plimpton, and she submitted an amicus brief for IP law professors in support of neither party. Um, and next to her, Paul Levy um, from Public Citizen, who submitted an amicus brief on behalf of three of his former clients, uh, Dan McCall, Sky Schatz, and Don Stewart in support of respondent. And then finally, uh, Rebecca Tushnet, a professor at Harvard Law School, who wrote an amicus brief uh, on behalf of uh, First Amendment professors in support of respondent. Um, so as you can hear just by who um, each of these speakers um, was speaking for, um, we have a real diversity. And then with <laughs> even within those categories, um, we have diff different views on how the court should solve the problem that they um, were looking at today. So um, just to give you a little primer before we speak, because when, when this conversation starts, we're going to be throwing out words like Rogers um, and explicitly misleading and artistic relevance and things like that. So I want to um, give you a little background. Um, the word speech does not appear anywhere in our Trademark Act, which is commonly known as the Lanham Act. Um, and yet the Trademark Act is a regulation of speech. <laughs> So frequently, we have trademark disputes where a trademark owner is not happy with someone's use of their mark, um, and the, def the, the accused defendant says, but, you know, like it or not, um, this is my free speech right to do this. Um, and so the question before the court today was, how should trademark law deal with those disputes? Um, and at one end of the spectrum of possibilities is just apply the infringement standard. Um, the infringement standard calls for the trademark owner to prove a likelihood of confusion. And, and possibly we may say that if a defendant is using a mark in a confusing way, then that confusing speech is not worthy of First Amendment protection. Um, and another possibility 
is what the Ninth Circuit did in this case, which is to say, we have a special test for these type of situations. Whenever the defendant is using someone else's mark in an expressive work, then we ask whether there is any artistic relevance to their use and that work and whether they are explicitly misleading. So this was um, the dispute. <laughs> um, the Supreme Court spent 90 minutes talking about this problem right here today. Um, and so this is um, VIP products, one of VIP products, many um, uh, products. Um, and they do a series of dog toys that are parodies of famous brands. Um, and this one is a parody of the Jack Daniels bottle. Um, it says bad spaniels. And there are a couple of excrement jokes in the in the label here. That, oh, poop. I'm so sorry. <laughs> poop jokes. <laughs> so um, here the Ninth Circuit said this is an expressive work. Um, and there is some artistic relevance between the brand and the speech. And there, it, it does nothing to explicitly mislead. Uh, and so VIP Products won the case. Um, and Jack Daniels is asking for the Supreme Court um, to overrule the Ninth Circuit. And what the Supreme Court will do and how they will do it and what they say. Um, well, I spent 90 minutes listening this morning and I cannot tell you, but hopefully we'll have some <laughs> insights um, from, from these um, speakers. So um, what I'd like to do is kind of whip, whip down the, the uh, table a few times. Um, I'd like to begin by asking each of our speakers to say very briefly, and if you speak too long, you will hear that noise. Um, <laughs> um, I'd like you to say, um, you know, what you argued in your case, Ben, today, um, or what uh, what was the the main point that you wanted to bring to the court's attention in your amicus brief, um, and then we'll that we'll come back with some further uh, questions. The trick for us. Oh, and please um, put oh. your uh, microphone on. Sorry. The trick for us was to figure out what we could accomplish in oral argument that we had not already done in the briefs. We came in with a strong defense of the Rogers test on the grounds that it was you know, strong First Amendment protection for what was really parodic speech mm -hmm. rather than a dog toy. The the you know, we had bounced back and forth between is this First Amendment case, is this a trademark case? Our brief had more First Amendment aspects to it. But uh, when we got to our argument, we realized going into the room, the Supreme Court or members of the court were either going to be on the side of the Rogers test or not. So we had to go to plan B in order to outline something we hadn't done in our brief, which was if they were remanding under the multi-factor test, the general kind of trademark test, what would the remand look like? So we gave a brief introduction that said, look, uh, parody, uh, celebrities in our popular culture are another form of celebrities. We get to comment on and make fun of celebrities. Jack Daniels made himself into everyone's friend if you look at their advertising and song lyrics. And we were just playfully comparing Jack Daniels to man's other best friend. The, uh, we then led a brief defense of the Rogers test in oral argument. And then we said, look, the, the Solicitor General, if you got, if you can use them as you're on your side, you want to. So we said, look, the Solicitor General agrees the multi-factor test doesn't apply in a straightforward way to uh, parodic works. Um, and the district court also misapplied the factors here. But if you're going to remand under the multi-factor test, you can't just tell the little courts, hey, keep in mind this is a parody. You have to give them better instructions of where or not left litigating a lot of things that don't count. And so we laid out a three-part test, which is kind of a modified form of the multi-factor test. One, can a court reasonably perceive a parodic character to the work? Second, um, what are the proximity and the uh, relatedness, competitiveness of the products? And third, does the product otherwise fail to uh, differentiate itself from the underlying work? We didn't want to use explicitly misleading because that was the language of the Rogers test and we wanted to differentiate the two. Uh, so that's basically what we argued. Because our opposing counsel had argued vehemently that everything um, really came down to whether or not you had a good survey showing there was likelihood of confusion, 
I impromptu added a line, which was the First Amendment is not a game show that results in the survey says, I'm confused, stop talking. And so that was our argument today. Okay. Um, actually, before I, I go to you, Carrie, um, because we did invite um, the uh, team of lawyers from Jack Daniels, um, I, I just wanted to um, uh, add very briefly what their argument was, and also the Solicitor General um, made an argument this morning. So very, very briefly, um, and if the lawyers for Jack Daniels have any problem with what I say, well, then they should have come. <laughs> but, um, so um, they argued that um, the likelihood of confusion test will adequately sort out um, all the First Amendment issues. There are no extraneous uh, First Amendment issues and confusing speech is not protected speech. Um, there, these are property rights and they need these strong, trademark rights are property rights that need these strong protections. Um, they did not advocate for a kind of narrowing of Rogers or a fix to Rogers. Um, in fact, they said that um, no judge made law should be able to supplant a statutory standard. And so the Rogers um, test is just inconsistent with the Lanham Act. Um, and they argued that there should be no special treatment uh, for parodies. Um, again, very briefly, the Solicitor General um, uh, argued that you have to apply the likelihood of confusion test, um, which um, if you uh, are not a trademark student yet, um, then you'll find out when you are that you need to go through several factors, eight, nine, 13 factors to determine likelihood of confusion. Um, there could be survey evidence and, and expert testimony, <laughs> um, but this, the Solicitor General said you have to apply that. Um, the Rogers test that the Ninth Circuit applied was in lieu of the likelihood of confusion test. Um, so the, the uh, Solicitor General did not think that was appropriate. Um, and the Solicitor General thought that the likelihood of confusion test can adequately um, sort out what is a protected parity and what is not. And finally, um, they argued that um, this is not a non-commercial use. Um, and so the Ninth Circuit was wrong in finding that protection. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, I was a member of a three-person team um, on the INTA, Intellectual Property Association um, amicus committee. If you don't know, INTA is, has uh, 6,500 members, member organizations from 185 uh, countries. So our brief started out with the premise that the Rogers test will survive. And I think after the oral argument, that is in question. But our main point was the lack of clear guidance of when Rogers or whatever um, heightened First Amendment analysis should be applied. When should it be applied? You're looking at a product. Um, how do you decide whether it goes to the Rogers way, the heightened first analysis way, or when do you decide it goes to just the standard trademark infringement factors? Um, every All the circuits, all the courts and all the circuits intuitively have done it right, except a little problem with the Ninth Circuit. So I think, but so I think there just needs, Inta thinks there just needs to be guidance on that um, dividing line. So what we did is we came up with a, uh, a definition. My, they didn't talk about it today. So that tells you something like they didn't like it. They didn't care about it. They didn't think it was any good, but here's our definition to decide. If you have a product, a movie, a book, a painting, if you strip all the expression away, do you still have a movie, a book or a painting? No, you don't. So if you've got that kind of a product, then you apply the heightened First Amendment analysis. But if you have products like sneakers, mugs, dog toys with some expression on them and you strip the expression away, do you still have a functional product? Sure you do. You have a blank dog toy, you have a blank mug. So those products get the standard multi-factor um, trademark infringement um, analysis. So where did we come up? Why did we come up with this definition? Well, we looked at the Rogers language, which you know now is probably out the window, but the Rogers language said where expression is inter interactually in intertwined with the product itself, such that the product cannot exist without the expression. That's what they were calling the Rogers 
and the movie. And that's why the heightened First Amendment should apply. Um, I, I really think the court is going to do something, you know, say no to Rogers, but create, hopefully create some language that all the circuits can insert into their multi-factor analysis. That's what I'm hoping. And I hope they realize that doesn't solve the problem because the courts and the litigants still won't know which side of the line, whatever product they're looking at should go. With all due deference to the INTA, which I've been a member for decades, <laughs> I'll disagree. Oh, okay. okay. All right, that's uh, fine. That's fine. That's that's why we have these that's jobs. Good, so do we. Yeah. <laughs> the um, one of the things I want to point out is that the argument today, and some of what we started out with here, is discussing this in terms of parody. Parody, by definition, is where you're making fun or comment on the person or the object that is affected. Quite frankly, even if you consider it uh, humorous, I consider that satire, which means they're not really commenting on Jack Daniels. As one of the justices asked, um, said, if your position is people with inflated egos, major corporations that think a lot of themselves, and you're allowed to poke fun at them, I mean, every single product made by every single corporation is subject to being parodically attacked, if I can put it that way. However, the point is, the Ninth Circuit doesn't have a parody exception. The Ninth Circuit had an exception for expressive works. Expressive work could be a painting, a movie, a song. In fact, they've applied it to songs. So let me give you an example. Um, you took, uh, if you had a vodka product and you put a rainbow on it, such because the person who made that product supported LGBTQ rights, okay, and then you added to it the name absolutely instead of absolute, okay, according to the Ninth Circuit, that's absolutely protected. Because what the Ninth Circuit did was not say, look at all the factors. And I'll talk about factors in a second. Look at all the factors. It said, you can't look at the factors. You can't look at confusion. It doesn't matter if 100% of people are confused. You're not allowed to look at them as long as it's an expressive work. It makes no sense. There's no text for it in the Lanham Act. There's no constitutional requirement for it. And there are a lot of cases and a lot of facts, a lot of circumstances under which there are absolute prohibitions. One of the ones that was cited today, of course, by, by uh, Jack Daniels, is the San Francisco Arsenal Athletics case, which Congress gave absolute property rights in Olympic under certain circumstances, and you don't have to prove confusion at all. And so that's more like a dilution standard. Touch on dilution. Dilution versus confusion. Dilution made a very slight appearance in the argument today. It was almost all directed at confusion, because that's really the core here. Dilution is a property right. That means it doesn't matter if people are confused at all. You can't use my name. That's like Olympic. Or are you confused? And the Lanham Act was adopted, although there are certain property right interests in it, it was adopted to protect the consuming public from confusion. And so that's really a heightened governmental interest. Now, going back a minute, um, one of the, 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 the factors and by the way, one I forget which justice was one of the justices that could have been uh, Justice Gorsuch said, you're out, you want to add, you want us to ask the, the um, Jack Daniels lawyers, are you asking us to put another factor in the Lanham Act likelihood of confusion test? There's like eight or nine in the Polaroid test. And you want to add another one, which isn't even in the statute. Well, first of all, the factors, none of them are exclusive, none of them are exhaustive. Every circuit's got a different list and they weight them differently. And every one of them has said, this is not an exhaustive list. And not a single one of them is in the statute. So I don't get the point there why that request was asked. But the, so the major difference here is VIP products wants using Rogers to have a threshold test that you're not allowed to even inquire as to confusion if you've got an expressive work. It ends the inquiry which doesn't make any business sense, doesn't make legal sense, is not in the statute, doesn't make constitutional sense, in my opinion. So uh, what you have to look at is, um, is there such a threshold test or what's being promoted by Jack Daniels and which I would support is you add that issue to the test. 
And quite frankly, this really should be a non-issue because a really truly parodic test use <clears throat> that make people laugh will almost always completely avoid confusion. And that would be a fact finding by the trier of fact, whether judge or jury. So you don't need to worry about it. If, however, the use is marginal, then you're going to find out whether there's confusion or not. And quite frankly, um, the court would not even, the judge would not even have to issue an injunction making them stop. They could craft a very narrow injunction or they could just not join it at all. So there's, the judge can handle it on, in the concept of whether there's an infringement and also in what the relief is. So I could go out for, I'm going to stop. Sorry. I'm, I'm, I'm getting ready though. Okay. <laughs> all right. Thank you very much, uh, Megan. Okay. So we, we filed a brief on behalf of a cohort of IP professors and our brief was also neutral. We're not taking a position as to whether this should be protected by the First Amendment. And I cited it approvingly during the argument today. I, I very much like that. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, that was definitely noted. Um, we got a few emails about that uh, uh, among our team as that happened, <laughs> as you can imagine. Um, but anyway, we, so we filed this brief on behalf of a, a cohort of IP professors, um, also a neutral brief, but we took a very different position. And so um, we think that a test like Rogers is absolutely necessary to pre preserve First Amendment interests and particularly the First Amendment interests of artists, um, because the likelihood of confusion analysis just isn't designed to balance the expressive interests um, against avoiding consumer confusion. But the brief recognizes that the Rogers test isn't perfect. Um, I'd like today to see that the justice is acknowledging that for decades now, almost every circuit has supported some version of Rogers, and that's because Rogers is necessary. Um, but one of the flaws that we've seen in Rogers and the way that the courts have applied Rogers is that it can be vague. And it's led to courts applying it differently. And that leads to both unpredictability, well, it leads to unpredictability for both brands and artists. Um, so we propose some changes to the Rogers test. Uh, the first change we propose proposed um, is to create a presumption that Lanham Act liability is precluded when a work is found to be an expressive work subject to the First Amendment. So if you can show that this is art, that there's commentary, that there is an underlying message here, you know, we think right away there should be a presumption that that should be protected by the First Amendment because that's what the First Amendment is designed to do. And so, in other words, in order to fully protect artistic interests, this presumption that artistic works cannot be subject to trademark infringement liability would apply unless the brand owner can show that there's a reason that the standard likelihood of confusion factors should apply instead. Um, and so that goes into the second you know, major revision that we propose which is, well, as Professor Farley said, the Rogers test now is you look at artistic relevance and then you look at whether there is anything that was explicitly misleading. And so we have proposed to replace the artistic relevance prong um, because that arguably, and as was acknowledged today, calls on the courts to take on the role of an art critic. And, you know, we're talking about art and expression. I don't know if the judges or me or any of us in the legal field are really in the position to say, I am, <laughs> except for <laughs> Professor Farley, she might be, um, <laughs> to say what is art and what is expression and what is not. Um, and so what we would do is we'd replace it with a clear gratuitousness prong. And this is the prong that got a shout out um, in Ben's argument. So rather than placing a burden on an artist to show that their use is relevant to the expression, the burden instead would go to the brand owner to show that the defendant's use is clearly gratuitous. And so that means that the, the artist or you know, whoever's putting out the expression is merely free riding on the plaintiff's goodwill. Now, we, we think that the First Amendment absolutely protects expression. What it doesn't protect is, well, let me just say this is a funny use of a brand so I can sell a bunch of products. Um, you know, we're, we're looking to protect valuable commentary on or criticism of a brand or a brand owner through parody, that's one example, but also through artistic representations of the world, 
you know, for instance, you know, accurately showing branded storefronts in a film or titles that flow naturally from a work. And so there, there is more to this than just parody and just whether something is funny. And we think this standard uh, protects that um, while weighing toward protection of the public from confusion where a defendant, you know, clearly just uses a brand's trademark to promote or sell its goods. And the last thing I, I would note about what we argued is that you know, we think it's really important that there's a medium neutral application of Rogers. And this is, this is in direct contradiction to some of the other briefs you'll hear about. Um, but what I mean by medium neutral is an artist should be able to pick the medium that they're going to use to express their point. So whether it's sneakers or dog toys or a painting or something we would call traditional expression, the First Amendment doesn't make any you know, exceptions for, well, if you do this kind of expression, it's protected, but this kind of expression is not. Um, and we just think it's really important to protect the artist's rights to use a variety of different mediums to express their ideas um, and not be confined to what, what has been labeled in this case as the traditional forms like painting or sculpture or music. Um, a good example of this is um, mischief brilliant artists. They have made sneaker art. They've expressed their art um, through these sneakers and a ver variety of other non-traditional mediums. The art has been you know, acknowledged and praised by worldwide by art critics. And they have the right, just like every other artist, to choose the medium that, that they um, want. So um, I, I will turn it over now, but that's uh, there's a lot to unpack there. Thank you, Megan. Well, I'm glad to be here, and it's particularly appropriate that a panel on this case be uh, take place at American University Law School because AU actually played a role in this case. The bullshit consumer survey on which the plaintiffs relied here was done by an AU professor, my late friend Gary Ford. Uh, our uh, amicus brief was filed for three. <laughs> <laughs> not the law, not a professor at the, he was not a professor at the law school. So my, our brief was filed on behalf of three former clients who did parodies. You can see what the parody is here. <laughs> uh, this is a parody of the slogan, ready for Hillary, that was <laughs> done in uh, 2016 when she was running for office. Um, and it was informed by the searing experience that I've had in defending parodies under the traditional likelihood of confusion factors. They're incredibly time consuming and expensive. Now, we had a client who hated Walmart, and he created a series of shirts on the theme of Wall Qaeda and Wall Acost. Also cited in my argument today. Right. <laughs> so we. Walmart uh, brought a claim for confusion, likelihood of confusion and dilution. They hired the worst consumer char survey charlatan of them all, Jacob Jacoby, whose study showed that nearly half of all consumers thought that Walmart had created this design <laughs> and called itself <laughs> Walkida. It took us 500 lawyer hours and two pro bono experts to get summary judgment in that case. The My Other Bag case, also cited in the brief. So somebody in LA had the idea of creating a series of bags that said My Other Bag on one side, and on the other side, you'd have a cartoon <laughs> of a famous uh, purse, in this case, uh, a Louis Vuitton purse. It took 1,500 lawyer hours to defeat the trademark and copyright claims in that case, and it was effectively pro bono because although a firm was hired at an hourly rate, the defendant ran out of money to fund the case and almost all the time was done pro bono. Without pro bono work, most paradists can't afford a legal defense under the likelihood of confusion factors. My t-shirt amicus clients faced demand letters and the reason they didn't get sued was that the plaintiffs, the would-be plaintiffs knew that I had the ability to defend them. I would be doing it pro bono and the defendants wouldn't be priced out of court. So our brief argues from a vantage point similar to Megan's brief and to Rebecca's brief, but with some differences. Now we've litigated several trademark cases involving gripe sites. 
persuaded courts to hold that the Lanham Act has no application to purely non-commercial speech. Sometimes we've argued it as a matter of statutory construction and sometimes as a matter of First Amendment law. We say the whole concept of regulating speech that is not false, but only misleading or confusing is far into the way the courts treat non-commercial speech under the First Amendment. Could a misleading political oration be enjoined simply because it's misleading without any falsity? But this case, unfortunately, was not litigated below on the theory that application of the Lanham Act to non-commercial speech would violate the First Amendment. And so though, although I agree with much of what Rebecca said in her brief, the First Amendment argument can't be openly considered here. It's only a background principle on, under which we can think about how to construe the Lanham Act. So what we argued instead is that Rogers provides a way of being faithful to the statutory text while screening out cases from the very costly process of litigation under the likelihood of confusion factors, also not found in the statutory text, situations in which alleged infringement would usually not be found. The use would durably be found permissible. But where we disagree with Megan's brief and with Rebecca's, is that in the end, likelihood of confusion is the statutory standard. So we agree with the Second Circuit's approach to the Rogers, the explicitly preceding prong of the Rogers test, that a particularly strong showing of likely confusion can be enough to condemn the ex ex accused test. And that is, we argue, what keeps Rogers within the statutory text. Despite the findings below, which were findings of strong likelihood of confusion, a 29% confusion survey, we argued for affirmance on two grounds. First of all, we said that da Jack Daniels' proposed test for when Rogers should apply, if it ever applies, is wrong. Some ordinary commercial goods are highly expressive, like these t-shirts. Mm -hmm. What matters is whether what's being sold is the speech or what's being sold is the utilitarian character of the items on which the expression is printed. And second, we argue, in the district court, Jack Daniels actually argued that they should get to trial on the Rogers factors. It could have made that argument to the Ninth Circuit, but instead it decided it wanted a test case about Rogers. And so we argue it waived its opportunity to argue that Rogers should uh, come out in its favor and that's a reason to affirm. Thank you, Paul. Rebecca? Hello. Um, all right, I'll try not to be too repetitive. Um, the argument here uh, uh, proceeds from uh, first the initial premise. If the law thinks that this toy is confusing, then as Charles Dickens said, the law is an ass. <laughs> right? um, we but, like her brief the best. <laughs> but, it is not an accident that the district court found confusion, despite what you can plainly see, because of how detached trademark doctrine has become from what consumers actually care about. The multi-factor test therefore routinely gets things wrong when it comes to non-commercial expressive uses, including things like the names of movies or whether uh, it is okay for uh, Disney to use caterpillar trucks uh, in, in as the enemy or as used by the enemy in George of the Jungle 2, actual lawsuit, or whether it's okay to put a slip and slide in a movie and have somebody slip on it and like peel their skin off because they didn't actually wet it down because they were dumb, right? Another actual lawsuit. Um, those lawsuits are plausible under the multi-factor confusion test. Uh, likewise with parody t-shirts. Um, so what's the solution? Well, both commercial and non-commercial speech are protected by the First Amendment, but the protection for commercial speech is much less than the protection for non-commercial speech. So false and misleading commercial speech can simply be banned, but not all false or misleading non-commercial speech can be banned. Um, and commercial speech is not any speech that's sold for money. Um, if you have you know, paid for HBO, you know, you know that's actually costs money. Um, and yet it is fully protected by the First Amendment. Speech that is itself the product being sold, like a movie or a video game or a soft sculpture is non-commercial. Speech that proposes a commercial transaction is commercial speech. Therefore, plenty of functional products are protected by the First Amendment when the reason that the law is regulating is the expression on the product. So Paul Cohen wore a jacket that said, fuck the draft, 
Uh, and he was arrested, not because he was wearing a jacket, but because of what the jacket said. The Supreme Court easily recognized that that implicated the First Amendment, despite the functionality of the substrate on which the message was printed. Um, so uh, a couple of uh, things, uh, so as not to be repetitive, I'll just make a couple of points. Um, so uh, you sometimes hear the claim made that true parodies are not confusing. That's just a bizarre assertion for two reasons. First, the confusion standard has gotten so out of whack that uh, if someone thinks, oh, the trademark owner had to give permission for the parody, then there can be liability. And Lisa Black up and said that at the argument that uh, mistaking the law was also actionable confusion, which creates terrible incentives for trademark owners to try and convince you that nobody can talk about them without permission. Um, separately, parodies can fail and still be parodies, right? Misunderstanding, whether it's like I didn't get the joke or uh, misunderstanding of what the law requires of parodists shouldn't generate liability. Um, and again, the court has recognized this in other First Amendment areas. The current confusion standard allows liability when a small percentage of people are confused, even if they don't care, like they buy it or not buy it either way. Um, and this is the case here. So the other thing that the brief argues for is that materiality is the key missing factor, especially when it comes to non-commercial uh, speech, that it, you should at the very least have to show that a substantial percentage of consumers care about the permission. Uh, question, as opposed to just like speculating about it. And it, again, this feeds back into itself because people aren't careful when they don't care. And the current confusion standard uh, is, it weighs the degree of consumer care in the likely confusion analysis. So when people don't care, they just have, they don't even think about it, then they're actually more likely to be confused. But that's a really bad idea from the perspective of uh, protecting speech. Um, one just note on dilution by tarnishment, uh, so this is uh, does not require confusion, therefore does not have the constitutional justification of protecting uh, uh, either the reputation of the trademark owner from like misattribution or a consumer protection function. Keep my name out of your mouth is not a rule that can constitutionally be applied to speakers. And frankly, it can't constitutionally be applied to commercial or non-commercial speakers. Uh, and uh, there, I have some hope the court will notice that. Okay, thank you very much, all of you, for um, packing so much into such concise statements. I appreciate it. Um, I imagine um, even the audience could detect that there were lots of points of disagreement amongst you. Um, and so I want to give you an opportunity to respond to, uh, you don't have to, um, but if you wanted to respond to some of the things that you just heard, then I'll, I'll start with you and, and go down the road again, Ben. Sure, I didn't get a rebuttal this morning, so I'll take one now. Uh, you know, before I was an appellate lawyer, I was actually a trademark lawyer. I still am one, but I was a full-time trademark lawyer. And I will tell you one thing. There is not a trademark owner, big trademark owner, that has ever laughed at a joke at its expense. If you look at the cases that have been brought, and part of what we said was, there are no laugh out loud jokes when you ask the people whose marks are being parodied. There aren't. If we said if the, if the test convicts a Wal Qaeda or a Holocaust or a parody ad in a parody magazine about Michelob Oily, which talked about oil being spilled in the water source for Anheuser Busch, if that test convicts them, then that test is broken. If you have to uh, spend thousands of hours, including on appeal, in order to vindicate Chewy Vuitton as a dog toy. OK, or you have to or uh, some of the other um, obvious parodies, then there are some that's the wrong tool. And if you say, well, we can go out and hire someone and we can press you to the wall because we can prove we don't get the joke. Well, uh, with all respect to uh, Justice Kagan, who was a law school classmate of mine, I don't know what happened there, because if you go on social media and you ask our customers, they're buying this because they think it's hilarious. They think it's laugh out loud funny. I understand Jack Daniels doesn't, but that's on Jack Daniels. But the most important thing is I did not pick this up and then go to pour myself a drink and realize, oh, wait a minute, this is 40% dog poop, okay? <laughs> no one thought this came from Jack Daniels. The only thing they thought is, wow, it looks like a Jack Daniels bottle and gee, maybe I have to get permission from Jack Daniels to do this. If that's true, then the people who put out the baby Trump balloons 
okay, are going to get sued by Donald Trump because they uh, had a Lanham Act violation, except for the because people will think that Donald Trump actually authorized that, and he probably would have. But the problem is, because he, Hillary, he probably loves the balloons, but the fact is most normal people would not license lampoons of themselves because they don't find them funny. And that's what the Supreme Court said in the parody copyright case when Two Live Crew was sued by Roy Orbison. Okay, that's just the reality. But everyone else, the average consumer, finds it funny and doesn't think this came from Jack Daniels, no matter what a survey says. Because if you could indict a ham sandwich, you can get a survey to accuse a product of causing confusion. That's the reality. So I was at Wells Fargo in the legal department for 32 years. There was actually in the Wells Fargo red box logo, instead of Wells Fargo stacked, it was Wells Fart Go. <laughs> we didn't sue. I knew, I, I mean, I said to the clients, to the marketing people. Thank you. Can you prove that anybody's confused over this? Of course you can't. So we, we, there were a lot of those kind of things came up and I, you know, and the clients would come to me all upset. Let's go after them. I'm like, we don't want to throw our money away. They get to make, they may get to comment on us. They hate us. Okay. We know that. And, and if we sue, it just brings down more on our heads about how much people hate us. So I, I, you know, you had to do that all the time. You had to, you had to knock some sense into them that move on. And so I don't, I don't quite understand all the lawsuits about you know, that, that the big companies are they fighting. They have fine lawyers and well, so tell I, them, don't do this. Yeah, don't do this. I mean, maybe it was because we're a bank and, and, and you just don't want to lose that trust. But I, I, I'm telling you, that, uh, yeah. So you got to, you look at it and you, you know, say, it, does this make any sense? Because are we going to win? Because once you start down the path, yeah. you're way down the path and you're spending millions of dollars, which we did about 25 years ago over internet uh, internet stuff <laughs> so uh, okay I'll, I'll take exception i'm oh, sorry i'll take exception to the comment that no big corporations ever laughed at a parody of their own product because as carrie pointed obviously some people get the joke and i've got lots of clients as i'm sure we all have where they've been convinced I'm not going to win this fight or it's not worth having the fight because after all saying they're making fun of me and it's hurting my feelings is not a good look. <laughs> so it, usually only case like this is brought when they really believe it's causing them a problem. And I keep seeing us go back to the concept of parody and no one's answered my point, which is it doesn't have to be parody. I postulated you putting out a bottle of vodka called absolutely with a rainbow on it, which makes it expressive. You support LGBTQ rights, okay? So that means you can't possibly sue them for infringing the mark absolute, even though it's one of the, probably the largest imported vodka sale product in the United States. Why can't you? Because it's expressive. And the Ninth Circuit would say, because it's a threshold question, you're not even allowed to look at confusion. And you could have 80% of the populace thinking that's an absolute product who's now supporting LGBTQ rights. And it's not. It's a it's a it's a counterfeit, quite frankly. So Ninth Circuit would not allow you to look at that. A um, couple of points. Um, I disagree with that, by the way. And I think the Ninth Circuit would, too. That's a knockoff. That's a competitive good. And that saying the Ninth no, no. Circuit would have allowed it is simply not. true. No, if you read if you read how they've applied for the last 20 years, how they've applied Rogers for Grimaldi and the expansion of it, they say it's a threshold question and you cannot look at confusion. And if where it's expressive, they it, it's like the goods. I mean, come on. What takes all my time? <laughs> Let's assume that it's the second circuit's approach to Rogers. Excuse me. Let's assume it's the Second Circuit's approach to Rogers v. Grimaldi rather than what's been portrayed as the Ninth Circuit's approach. That is to say, let's assume that you apply a test where super confusion is enough to overturn the uh, overcome the expressive use. What's wrong with that? Well, one, I don't see any textual support for super confusion. There's well, either life it's, to the confusion, it's confusion or there isn't. Well, you know, the, the statute doesn't say what degree of confusion has to be found to, to create infringement. Likelihood of confusion, there can be a range of likelihoods. Is there a range of likelihoods set in the statute? 
No, and that's why I think you have to leave it to the courts on a case by case basis to determine it. And I will say, and, and I've heard a lot to the court. I, mean, I will the... say, I've heard a lot of. In fact, <laughs> Justice Thomas thing brought it up. The cost of one of these cases. I'm unaware of any other circumstance where a statute is considered unforceable or inapplicable because it costs mm -hmm. to litigate. That's uniquely applied here, saying you if it costs a lot of money. Federal Election Commission, Commission versus Wisconsin's right to life. When you have free speech at stake, the cost of litigation, the open-ended rough and tumble factors are absolutely a consideration. I and, know it's not trademark law, but the First Amendment law. And, and, and Walmart and okay. Samara. Walmart. <laughs> Obviously, I'm stirring the pot. Everybody get a chance. We can, we can go all night. It's okay. Um, so, le so let me finish, and then if you call, you'll have your turn. Right. Oh, okay. I'll touch on a couple of things. Um, in terms of, like, speech, your comment, that's clearly political speech. I'll give you an example. We talked about the Olympic Committee getting the rights to use the word Olympic um, without any restriction on proving confusion. And yet, in one of the first tests of that case, they lost because it was a, they were T-shirts again. Point Fred, they were telling T-shirts that said "Stop the Olympic Prison," because they were using money, the Olympic money, to build uh, uh, to fit a prison in New York with uh, out for all the athletes. And so nobody wanted to do that, so they said "Stop the Olympic Prison." They brought that; it was purely commercial, even though they were selling the T-shirts for twenty dollars a T-shirt. Because so that's not the test. The test was, again, going whether the speech is what you're talking about. And there's really no confusion there. Everybody knew it because it was a criticism. And quite frankly, if you're criticizing somebody, that's also going to guarantee people are not going to think there's, there's an association or approval because nobody would do that. If they had, uh, going back to my point, which nobody's answered, but except I've heard you saying that absolutely would, abs would absolutely, Ninth Circuit would absolutely find that the infringement, not under the test as they've applied it in this case. Is there artistic relevance for your example of absolutely? No. Well, the answer is you have a bottle of vodka and you put a rainbow on it because you support LGBTQ rights. Is that expressive? We'd all agree that's so expressive that use. The next step. Is there? Is there? And then the label you say this bottle of uh, vodka is absolutely Amen. because I absolutely support LGBTQ rights. Would absolute say? Wait a minute. Just because you had an ly at the end, you're not infringing. And by the way. Nobody addresses the fact that the trademark owner, this I think this is brought up briefly in the reply today, the trademark owner has his expressive rights too, his free speech rights, and he uses his trademark to express whatever they want to express. Even though, for example, the argument was made that Jack Daniels takes themselves too seriously, that's with their expression. And why are their expression rights trumped by those of the infringer? We did not stop for now because- I mean, I, now Megan's turn, let me, let me Megan's just, turn. Let me just say something. <laughs> we, no one got an injunction to stop Jack Daniels or anyone else from speaking. Okay? So their First Amendment express rights was there. The answer is more speech, not less speech. If you put off a knockoff brand of vodka, that's explicit in this league. Rogers doesn't protect it. And the Ninth Circuit has never applied it to competitive goods. And even we said that today, that you have to look at the proximity or competitiveness of the good. So I think you're smearing the Ninth Circuit unfairly. But the fact is, whether you call this satire or parody of speech, we compared the Jack Daniels to dog poop. That's not a criticism? I don't know. Maybe Jack Daniels doesn't think it's a criticism. Okay. But I mean, you got to be fair to the cases and fair to the courts. I don't even know where to start here. <laughs> um, but I'll, I'll start by responding to what Ben just said and this notion of um, Rogers doesn't apply when you have a competitive good. So if you're, we'll, we'll take the absolute example and absolute sells vodka and you put a rainbow on a bottle of vodka. And the argument here is, oh, well, in that case, it doesn't apply because it's a competitive good. What is the basis and where is the precedent for saying that? Where does the first amendment say it's not protected speech if it's a protect if it's a competitive good. Where does the law say that? And they're actually, if if you if you look back, there's nowhere that that distinction is drawn. And the First Amendment, like you can't parse the First Amendment to say, you know, this is free speech, but only if you do it on this type of product, only if it's a non-commercial product, only if it's a non-competitive product. I mean, the two cases that I see supported or cited for that proposition 
One is the um, Charbucks solution case. Uh, it was Starbucks sued another coffee company. They, were, they named their coffee Charbucks. And what the court found there is this isn't a parody. It, there's no message. There's no commentary here. You were simply putting the name Charbucks on coffee in order to evoke Starbucks and sell more coffee. There's no commentary. And commentary and expression is what the First Amendment protects. That certainly doesn't stand for the proposition that there can never be First Amendment expression uh, on a competing coffee brand. It, you know, what you need is that, is there expression? Um, the other case is the Harley Davidson case. And that's a case in the Southern District of New York where there was a motorcycle repair shop and they took Harley Davidson's logo and the pig and they, and they, or they turned it into a pig. It was something, it was a funny version of Harley Davidson's logo. And again, the court said, no, this isn't a parody. There's no commentary on Harley Davidson. You were simply trying to evoke Harley Davidson, which is a competing motorcycle repair shop or has competing motorcycles. There's actually, there's nothing anywhere that says if it's a competitive good, it doesn't have First Amendment protection. And I, I think we really need to go back to, you know, the underpinnings of the First Amendment. It, is there commentary? Is there expression? And does it deserve to be protected? And this brings you back to the test that we proposed in our brief, which is if it's clearly gratuitous, if you're doing what Charbox was doing, or you're doing what this motorcycle repair shop was doing, and you're simply trying to sell products based on a brand, that's not protected. That's not First Amendment expression. But when you're making art, and there's actually art on a competing vodka bottle, that's First Amendment expression, and there's no limitation for that. Okay, thank you. Paul. So would you say, and I guess this is a question both to Ed and to Megan, would you say that absolutely with the rainbow on the bottle of vodka, is that trying to sell another bottle of vodka, preying on Absolute's mark, or is that expression? It certainly doesn't seem to be expression about Absolute in any way. I mean, look, I think, I think you, I don't know. What are they trying to do? And that's what I think it's on, you know, the artist should say, is there expression? Is there, you know, you should get a presumption if you can say there's expression here that's underlying it. But is it expression about the mark or the mark holder? Well, Ed, do you see it as expression about the mark or the mark holder? No, I holder? don't. And neither does the Ninth Circuit. The Ninth Circuit said anything, the slightest little expression is, is sufficient to knack this threshold test. Uh, what they consider the threshold Rogers v. Grimaldi test. So it doesn't have to be that you're expressing yourself about that product. You're expressing yourself however you want. I'll give you another example, like to go beyond my absolute. Suppose a painter paints a beautiful picture of something that includes a brand in it, Nike swoosh or something like that, and decides I'm going to put that on a box and sell product, any kind of product, sell T-shirts instead of shoes. Is that expressive? Clearly it's expressive. Are they allowed to do that? Is there a commercial aspect? Is there an expressive aspect? Absolutely for both. Should that be exempt from the Philanum Act? And a position I took is, and I think is correct, but everybody's got their own view, is yes, it should be subject to it. And so what I think you know, is going to happen is that you, you need to include the, everything we've talked about today, and everybody's right. These are all issues you need to consider. You consider them as part of the analysis in the case as a whole. So under the analysis that we presented, I would say this is not a case in which the expression is being sold. This is a case in which a rival risk product is being sold. And so it's not uh, protected by the Rogers test. Well, I, I wanna go on to read an excerpt from today's oral argument, which I, I thought was quite stunning. Uh, Justice Alito <laughs> asks uh, Lisa Black, could any reasonable person, and this goes to some of the things that were talked about uh, by some of my colleagues here. Could any reasonable person think that Jack Daniels had approved the use, that use, this use of the mark? Lisa Blatt says, absolutely, that's why we won. She said it with a straight face. And one thing you will learn you as- You know that she said it with a straight face. You're standing behind her. Uh, uh, no, no, no. I was watching her. I was right next to her. She, she had either a straight face or a grimace. It was hard to tell, but it was not a smile. And well, so that's, that's the skill. Says, all, all right, all right. 
let me envision this scene. Someone in Jack Daniels comes to the CEO and says, I have a great idea for a product we're going to produce. It's going to be a dog toy, and it's going to have a label that looks a lot like our label, and it's going to have a name that looks something like our label, Bad Spaniels. And what's going to be in purportedly in this dog toy is dog urine. You think the CIA CEO is going to say, that's a great idea. We're going to produce that thing. No, but Nationwide ran a Super Bowl commercial with a dead child in it. Some people make dumb commercials. Skipping the point. I, what I saw the justices doing in the argument, and this is sort of the next phase of what we're going to talk about, I saw them struggling to come up with a way to deal with this sort of problem without necessarily saying that Rogers applies in this case. And I'll talk a little later about what I think the justices might do with the case. But I saw a lot of struggle and worry, recognition of the First Amendment's application in some of these cases and trying to figure out how to deal with it. Rebecca? So, um, all right, I'm gonna, uh, I'll try and also do some transition stuff, but um, I, I, a couple of small points, although it's probably moot. Uh, the particularly compelling test is not the Second Circuit test for Rogers, uh, except for in title versus title cases where the plaintiff has rights in an expressive work. Admittedly, some district courts have gotten this wrong, but the same judge who wrote uh, Rogers wrote the follow-up case uh, where he said, yes, this one's a title versus title conflict, and so we need a particularly compelling uh, uh, showing of likely confusion, even though we don't apply Rogers. Um, relatedly, the Stop the Olympic Prison case did not use the multi-factor test. It just said, this isn't actionable, and I'm worried that if I found it to be actionable, the Lanham Act would be unconstitutional. And by the way, the Stop the Olympic Prison people were not criticizing the USOC. They were criticizing the state of New York for repurposing the Olympic venue. So the, like, is it a fair target uh, uh, question is actually much more complicated. Um, in terms of uh, speech interests, a basic First Amendment principle is that the government can't silence the speech of some to enhance the relative voice of others. Um, so, you know, it's true that Jack Daniels might have to fight in the marketplace because of this. That's what everyone has to do. Um, so in terms of the, the vodka, all right, here's my take on it. Commercial speech includes product labels. The question should be whether there's an underlying product or whether the speech is inextricably intertwined with the product being sold as it is with a movie. So to change, to edit out the Caterpillar trucks in George of the Jungle 2 would be to change the movie itself. But changing the vodka bottle doesn't change the vodka. And changing the Charbucks package doesn't change the coffee beans therein, which people will buy and consume separately from the package. So it's not always easy, but it is a distinction courts have gotten practice with in commercial speech doctrine more generally. Um, so, and then a, a sort of larger comment, especially as we're getting into talking about uh, what, the, uh, what the argument said. So, Trademark scholars have for a long time said that the concept of use as a trademark or designation of source um, was really screwed up and uh, was actually causing a bunch of problems. And we were right. Uh, the court, uh, especially Justice Jackson, clearly believes that there's something special about passing off one good as being made by another competing producer. And she's right. But the definition of designation of source has gotten so tangled up in the confusion test that there are no doctrinal tools to handle that, right? So, uh, so, so people who think, oh, they got permission are counted as confused, even though they clearly don't think Jack Daniels distilled this dog toy. Um, and there are some faux ami in the, in the statute, so commercial use versus use in commerce. Those, neither of those things are the same to each other, and they're also not commercial speech, but it's really tripping people up. And uh, I can talk about some howlers that got said in the argument, maybe when we get to that stage. Okay, great, thank you. Um, and so um, as, as the last two speakers alluded to, I wanted to ask the panelists to reflect on the argument today. Um, I have picked out a number of things you can't do it yourself. So I think you probably can. <laughs> um, so if you just, if, if, if each of you want to just sure. to a, a couple of things that you thought were interesting or revealing. Going in, we had no idea, and going second, you know, I had to say, okay, where, where, the, what views have the justices expressed? So I know someone has listened to me, so I don't have to beat a dead spaniel or a dead horse or whatever. And, <laughs> and so I, I know my message has gotten across. 
So I think there were a number of justices who understand that in the end, there has to be an earlier off ramp in litigation for parodies and other expressive speech where you're not dealing with people selling some other brand of vodka or anything like that, because we think that would be actionable too. We're not selling bad Spanish whiskey. So I think they realize where they want to end up. They're not sure how to get there. And that's why, uh, you know, we thought that one or more justices might ask us, well, if we remand, what should the remand say? What should the test be? And we got that question from, ju from Justice Gorsuch. And to us, that was kind of a relief that people were talking about, okay, where do we move forward? Whether it's the Rogers test or whether it's some new test, because, you know, Supreme Court can do whatever it wants. And so what do we want it to do? What makes sense? How do we screen out the absolutely vodkas or the Stonio pot lace cookies or whatever, and leave speech where people are buying this because it's a joke, not because they think it's an off-brand of whiskey. Okay, we don't sell Jack Daniels whiskey. And so we thought with that being the focus, if we could move past you know, the discussion of what the exact doctrinal base is and get down to a rule that would help speech, but keep out knockoffs, we'd be in a good place. And I think they're heading that way. They may not be have a majority opinion of that gets where they all agree on the mechanism, but as long as the rule that comes out provides relief while still safeguarding against, uh, you know, bad stuff, uh, we, we'd be happy. Where were you going? You had a you proposed a hypothetical near the end about a a, a, a stuffed like art, like what? yeah. Okay. And I like that because I think if you apply, so so you make the bottle. But now it's a piece of art right. that you're going to put on the shelf. Apply my the into test, and if you strip it completely of whatever it is, there's nothing there. Therefore, Rogers applies. Well, here's here's what it's interesting. Here's my hypothetical. Justice Kagan was going off on the, but it's a common ordinary product, and we said, well, you know. The medium is in the eye of a holder. What if we change same product? We change the hand tag to say not for use with real dogs, and we sold it as a collectible to sit on a shelf as just funny novelty art, kind of a just like that. And in fact, the testimony for the person who designed the, the label was that they always thought it would be a collectible because people would find it funny and want to buy it and not give it to their dogs. My dog is not getting this. Uh, the uh, <laughs> And so the question then is, if it's just sitting on the shelf, sold as art, it's the same exact thing, but it's no longer um, a utilitarian good. It's just a piece of soft sculpture, to use a copyright term. Um, and so that's what we tried to posit to show that this whole test, there's one part where Lisa and I agree, which is that the utilitarian product distinction makes no sense. She wants to extend the Kill Rogers for everybody. We want her to extend it to everybody that's expressive. Um, and so that to us was an illustration that was in our brief as well, that, you know, you could strip a painting of all expression, you still have a useful utilitarian good. It's called a canvas. If you strip a t-shirt of all expression, it's still a functional good, it's plain white tea. So that test just doesn't work very well. It doesn't really mean anything in the modern age, the 3D printing, where you can embody expression in anything you want. But we were trying to make that example, don't change the product, change the hang tag and tells you what to do with it. And now it's art, but before it wasn't, that doesn't make any sense. Okay, I'm gonna pass. Yeah. Okay, um, thank you. Um, hardly know where to begin. Okay, um, the concept of whether something has utility, like your point about this is a dog toy versus a piece of sculpture, soft sculpture on the shelf, doesn't mean it's not a commercial product. The fact that that's why you sell art commercially is what people, artists paint them by and large is to sell them. So, but it's commercial, it's got nothing to do with quote, sort of functional utility. Uh, I thought that the uh, court, all the members of the court who spoke, there were only seven of them, all had problems with Rogers v. Grimaldi. Uh, they're struggling, I agree, they're struggling with what do we do about it? Uh, I'm not so sure that the Supreme Court um, is going to lay out like a, nine factor test for applying it. I think I think they're and they don't need to reverse uh, Rogers v. Grimaldi either because they can just confine that to its own facts. You really get almost where you need to be in this country 
by just throwing the Ninth Circuit decisions out and keeping the decisions in every other circuit that looked at these issues, which look at it in the context, the overall use and the overall appearance, the overall reaction to the consumer. And I think that's what we should be looking at. And so I think that you're going to get a decision that's going to reverse this case, how it gets remanded, whether it gets remanded for further proceedings. I don't know. I don't know how they would do it since it wasn't, a, as I don't I recall, maybe I, I'm wrong. They did not appeal uh, the, la the finding. They did not attack. The judge below did not find that the findings of actual confusion or likelihood of confusion were incorrect. They just attacked it on the Rogers v. Grimaldi basis. I, I could be wrong, but I'm saying that's, uh, uh, so I think that it's going to be a, uh, we're not going to really recognize what they're going to say, but it's not, I don't think it's going to be a nine point test and I don't think it's going to be letting it stand. So we're in between, Un not unusually. Okay. Uh, I, I agree with a lot of that. Um, I, I thought the justices seemed particularly fixated on parody, like this, this, what is parody? Is it funny? How funny is it? Um, and how the likelihood of confusion tests can account for non-confusing erotic uses. And, you know, I, I wonder and I worry, like, are they just going to remand it for this application of likelihood of confusion, um, taking into account the parodies? There is a lot of talk about that. And, you know, are we even going to go into Rogers at all? And do they need to go into Rogers at all? And or are they, you know, are they going to, there's just so much focus on parody without this recognition that Rogers stands for so much more than just parody. And are we going to be in a situation where there's, they're going to say, you know, go apply the right likelihood of confusion factors for parity and not take into account all of the other kinds of expression, you know, the um, titles of artistic works that was actually at issue in Rogers v. Grimaldi, depictions of the real world. I, these are the categories I mentioned, you know, a, a still life painting that includes a product or video games that includes a depiction of a storefront or the non-successful parodies, and there's finally some recognition of that at one point during the argument, but the non-successful parodies that are nonetheless expression. And so um, I did think it was interesting. There was some support for Rogers, although some skepticism and some acknowledgement that we should pair it back in some way. And um, I think there's a real question after the argument, you know, is how narrow is this decision actually going to be? And are we going to be before the Supreme Court, you know, next year on something outside of the parody context. If we can, I'd like to ask Carrie and Megan a question and I'll, I'll bring this up. Roger V. Grimaldi did not involve a trademark. It involved a right of publicity. That is a mistake. I'm sorry. I tried to claim under 1125. May I answer? May I answer? Well, could I finish my point? <laughs> answer you want to finish. Okay. It has a claim under 1125A. The principal claim was a right of publicity claim, and there was a defamation claim. All right. And so the issue there, first of all, there can't be a trademark in a single title of a single work like a movie. Just you can't get it. You have to have multiple uses. But the second thing is, Ginger would we think that, that Ginger Rogers had a trademark in Ginger? But what about Ginger from uh, uh, Gilligan's Island? I mean, the fact is uh, that, that really the point- character. What? That was a fictional character, Ginger Rogers. This should make a difference. Shouldn't make a difference. So Sorry. <laughs> before I talk about what I wanted to talk about, I'm going to respond to your mischaracterization. It was very unfortunate to see this sort of mischaracterization in a brief from the Solicitor General's office. Uh, back when Rogers v. Grimaldi was decided, uh, at the trial court level, um, there had been an amendment to 1125A, but it hadn't taken effect at the time of that litigation. But even before the amendments, which added the words likelihood of confusion to 1125A, the courts consistently, and we addressed this in a footnote in our brief, and I, some of the other briefs addressed it more directly, the courts of appeals and the Second Circuit in particular consistently applied the likelihood of confusion standard to decide 1125A cases. So it's a mischaracterization of the decision. I'm sorry you repeated it. My comments about the- I did not say it was not 1125A, but they shouldn't apply the likelihood of confusion test. It's true. It's not a trademark. Okay. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
it was Ginger Rogers claimed had an interest in her name not being misused used in a misleading fashion, similar to trademark law. In any, and she brought a claim under 1125A. Everybody on the court understood that the First Amendment places some limits on trademark law. And I think the justices were struggling for a way to rule in this case narrowly without necessarily placing curbs on Rogers v. Grimaldi. Uh, some recognized the impact of the cost of litigation on speech, uh, pricing it out of court. And that's been recognized not only in the case that Ben cited, but also by the Supreme Court itself in Walmart v. Samara, which says you don't want to have rules which are so expensive to apply that it's difficult for defendants to defend themselves. They were looking for a textual hook for Rogers. And unfortunately, the only person arguing this morning, Ben, didn't defend Rogers as a textual interpretation of the statute. There was a way to do that, as we argued in our brief. Ben, I think, threw Rogers v. Grimaldi under the bus. Uh, and I think he essentially admitted in his argument, that's the way the argument came across to me, that the court has to vacate and remand. He did not defend Rogers as applied by the Ninth Circuit. He said it had to be reformulated along the lines suggested by Megan's amicus brief. Well, if it has to be reformulated, then the court has to vacate and remand for application of Rogers in a proper way. Ben also appealed to, appeared to argue that a remand was most appropriate by putting in his opening two minutes a three-part rule for parodies that the Ninth Circuit could be directed to apply on remand. Now, that I thought was an interesting gambit. He put it in his opening to make sure he got it said, because sometimes you put in your opening things you're not sure you're going to get to in response to questions. But I think it could have left the impression that he admits that the Ninth Circuit decision could not stand. Now, some justices were stuck on the argument that VIP used bad spaniels as its mark, as an indication of source, which they have an out to do, both because they understood this to have been decided below, I think erroneously, and because the complaint can be read as making that exception, making that admission. And if the parody is used as an indication of source, as part of a message about why consumers should buy this product, then arguably it's not non-commercial. So if I have to predict what's going to happen, being hopeful, I see this as nine nothing to reverse and remand hopefully on the narrowest ground available, that in this case, based on concessions in the complaint and the findings below, bad spaniels was a designation of source and Rogers doesn't apply when the mark is used as a designation of source. And the court doesn't have to address Rogers any further than that. The opinion stresses the need to consider First Amendment considerations of the use of marks for purpose of commentary. Some may say that Rogers is appropriate in some circumstances. Some may say you do it in the course of the likelihood of confusion factors, but that's my prediction. Not nothing to reverse. Fred, thank you for using similar to a trademark. I agree with you. <laughs> Rebecca? Uh, yeah, yeah, no, there's, uh, from 1947 <laughs> on, uh, it, it took, well, okay, probably by 1950, uh, courts were treating uh, the Lanham Act uh, 43A as protecting unregistered trademarks. Um, it, it's true they may it may also protect a thin skein uh, of stuff around that, but I mean, uh, it, it was a trademark case. There was also a defamation and a right of publicity claim, which were separately addressed. Uh, so anyway, um, I think uh, what, what we've heard is that the court seems uh, uh, poised to do something unfortunate because of the gap between the intuitive meaning of designation of source, which is like, yeah, you know, this is who it's from, uh, versus the judicial interpretation, which is uh, if people are confused, then it's serving as a designation of source, including if they're confused about whether you needed permission, and including whether, you know, 10 to 15 percent of consumers are confused about that. So, if it means the intuitive meaning, 
of designation of source, uh, then you know that's not the worst rule in in the world. Um, if it means the meaning that's developed over the course of you know sixty years, uh, then there is no First Amendment defense at all. We're just listening to these terrible surveys. Um, so I, just, I want to highlight a couple of things, um, most of which go to uh, th this larger point about like what is what is use as a trademark, what is designation of source. So Sotomayor, I think, uh, very appropriately pointed out the Polaroid factors aren't in the statute either, right? So so we are looking for a statutory interpretation, and we are not required to do any of the circuits tests. Um, one thing that I think that we haven't talked about is a question from Alito where he seemed to be getting at this question, could we say that the reasonable person standard, would this confuse a reasonable person, is a normative standard. It is an objective reasonable person standard and not an empirical one. If we do that, almost all of our troubles go away. And you know, and I think uh, Lisa Blatt really understood that that was a risk because she hit back very hard on that, although obviously I'm not convinced, but uh, you know, <laughs> some, some, some may be. Uh, because if it's an objective reasonable person standard, that is not confusing, right? Um, and so um, the last thing I'll say is I do think that the uh, confusion about, you know, what is a trademark use caused a couple of these real howlers in the argument. So Lisa Blatt said, gone with the wind isn't a trademark. Um, has anyone told Turner Entertainment and its registration for gone with the wind for books? Because, <coughs> Um, uh, she also said in rebuttal, a TikTok video is not use in commerce. Again, has anyone told the US government that? Like, it's definitely use in commerce, it's just not commercial speech. That's the difference, And uh, but unfortunately, I don't have a high degree of confidence that that's gonna get sorted out. Can, can I make a comment? Um, because I've been accused by my good friend, Paul, of, of throwing Ginger Rogers under the bus, which I would never do. I'm a huge Ginger Rogers fan. And she famously said she did everything Fred Astaire did except backwards in, and in high heels. Uh, so you will not uh, hear me throwing her under the bus. On the other hand, you know, we made a, the best technical defense we could in our brief, and so did the Miki of the Rogers test. I've got two minutes. OK, if I haven't convinced them with all the hundreds of pages of briefing that's gone mm -hmm. in, I've got to have a plan B. OK, if I go back to the Ninth Circuit, I'm feeling pretty damn good that the Ninth Circuit's going to see the world. I will. And they'll say, thanks for sending us back. We still think this is hilarious. Uh, you know, VIP is going to win. So I've got to make sure that my rear end is covered and that there's air in my tires when I get my bus gets back to the Ninth Circuit. And so I've got to use that time to pivot and say, and when I started to hear the questions about what would the remand look like, it confirmed to me that that was the strategy. This sure. was my chance to lay out the three-part test, which we had worked through with moot courts, five of them, including one with Paul and another one with Rebecca. Um, and we tried to figure out what would that remand test look like? And it turns out if that's what they were going for, the oral argument was not gonna change their mind. And we had a plan for what would the opinion say when it remanded. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, thank you all for this. This is a lot of food for thought. And I think you probably are chomping at the bit to get into the discussion, or maybe you're afraid to get into the discussion. <laughs> um, but let me challenge you. Um, so now is your time. Any questions for this wonderful panel? Okay. All right. Well, you, why don't you go while people work up the nerve? So the question is, who reported up the Roger standard in the Michael Irvin hold Will the holding of that start to the free market campaign? What would the impact be of requiring whether the proposed market is artistic prior to analyzing the product? I guess it has played, played the consequences of this. Exam. You know, you. It's. A, I, I guess it's not as much. I would expect in the examination procedure and possibly in opposition proceedings. I guess in that phase of it. Um, you know, it's funny because Lisa Blatt um, uh, expressed outrage at the Solicitor General for not 
defending 30 years, 40 years, or what, 300 uh, decisions in the PTO and their body of law. That was a shrewd move by the SG because after the decisions on disparaging marks in um, TAM and moral, immoral and scandalous marks in Brunetti, uh, I don't think the PTO and its decision-making process are held in high regard by the Supreme Court. Um, so they're going to do what they're going to do. I think it might have effect opposition proceedings and maybe some not on the tarnishment side so much as on the um, on whether confusion. Um, but I'm not sure what affects PTO proceedings with all respect. Um, I'm, you know, that's a, for the, for our concern as people who are operating in the marketplace. That's the least of our problem. I would say that I don't think the U.S. PTO examiners or examining attorneys, I should say. Uh, really take into account um, parody, satire, they, they just don't do it. Uh, and also I, I would point out though that, well, I don't necessarily disagree with you about decisions of examiners and, and, and the USPTO, in point of fact, there was a statute or regulation which provided you could not register scandalous or immoral marks right. and they applied it. So when they got slapped down, it was for applying that, not necessarily independently coming up with that, but we applied it and the rule was you can't apply it because that's a flat out restriction on free speech. And, and so I think it was the right decision. No, what, what they got slammed for, if you read the opinions, was the incoherence of their pattern of application. You had rejections and acceptances of marks that could not be squared with each other. So it was not said, I agree, the PTO didn't create the problem. But the fact that they apparently could not have a consistent line about what was scandalous, immoral, or disparaging under the two statutes just couldn't be defended. It was entirely arbitrary and incoherent. And, and that's what they got slapped for. And it's one example of that. Uh, there's a rejection of saying 50 years ago, somebody applied for the word Madonna for wine. And it was rejected by the PTO because Jesus's mother right. would not have drunk wine because that's sinful leaving out the marriage feast at Cana, where Jesus <laughs> made one. Let's leave that out. Point of fact is then 50 years later, another company comes along and applies for Madonna for wine. And he said, that's fine. And they register it because views change. And you really can't have a statute that depends on what the current mores are to have that, which is why I think the, the Supreme Court rightly said you can't apply that. Okay, Josh? Oh. I'm really concerned about how the court thinks it's going to get away from First Amendment balancing here. Um, and for one thing, I mean, Starbucks, everybody knows Starbucks burns their beans and therefore it's a highly expressive. <laughs> Similarly, you know, you guys are really funny. I tell jokes, people don't get them, but it's no less a joke or a parody, right? So if the interest is of the speaker, not of the consumer who's hearing the speech, how does that get balanced here? But by the way, as I recall, Charbucks actually won, and they said it was not a comment. They denied it. They they, they, they were stupidly counseled. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, they and they were held not to be confusingly similar because of the whole look of a big bear on the package, whatever. And I thought when I heard it that oh, they must have lost because it was a joke about how bad Starbucks coffee is since Howard Schultz took over the company. And yes, he did destroy Starbucks coffee for those who drank it in the eighties in Seattle. Yeah. But. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it, it, but you're right. It cannot turn on whether the joke is in good taste or not, or whether the joke succeeds or not. Half of mine don't. I seem to have landed a couple today, so it made me feel feel redeemed. But the um, you're right. It, it can't, and they have to. And I think everyone on, on the court understands there has to be breathing space under the First Amendment. They're not sure how to get there. Whether right. they can get there atextually or they can get there by formulating a textual test that nevertheless gives you that. Balance. But but the less the joke succeeds, the more confusion there is. So you have a disconnect of First Amendment purposes and statutory purposes here. Isn't the First Amendment supposed to trump? That's what I'm trying to figure out. Where I mean, does it, how does the, how does just creating a new test avoid that problem? I, I think that's exactly why you need Rogers or a version of Rogers that it, for exactly what you just said, because not every parody is funny. Uh, some, they mean to be, but they're not all funny exactly. and not everything's a parody. And so that's, you know, it can't just be because somebody doesn't get a joke and it's it's confusing. And I think that uh, Justice Sotomayor, when she said, well, if it's 25 percent confusing or 75 percent confusing when talking about the political speech, it was definitely an acknowledgement that expression has to be protected. Um, and the 
to me, the point is that's exactly why you need Rogers. Paul? I mean, the problem is that this case wasn't litigated under the First Amendment. Uh, I mean, you know, that was, uh, and there were so many other good arguments that I assume defense counsel just decided they didn't need to do it that way. I mean, Justice Gorsuch talked about bringing an as applied challenge, although, you know, you're litigating these cases as a defendant. And so what you're really arguing when you argue the First Amendment is that the First Amendment precludes the application of the statute to these particular facts, not an as applied challenge so much as sort of a First Amendment defense. But that's not in this case because of the litigation decisions made below. And, and I'll say that's instructive to everybody in the room. When you're litigating a case, you know, you have the immediate demands in the trial court, whether it's state or federal, about what claims are you going to use and whether you don't want to make everything into the grand challenge. You just want your client to win. So they made a series of tactical decisions. I wasn't involved until the uh, petition for a rehearing on Bonk in the Ninth Circuit the first time around. And they make tactical decisions about what challenges they want to bring and what offensive uh, moves they want to make. For example, the lawyers decided they were going to challenge the protectability of Jack Daniels' bottle shape. Um, I would not have done it because I was looking at it as a parody case, and to me, those are intention. But they decided, you know, I, I say with respect to trademark lawyers, and many people who specialize in a particular field, when you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. And when you get a case that's called a trademark infringement case, you apply the trademark infringement tools to it. You don't immediately jump to, this is the great First Amendment case that will ultimately end up in the Supreme Court. Now, that being said, one of the great prognostications comes from our trial judge after the trial, the original trial, before the first appeal and the, and the remand. He said in his closing comments, you know, I'm sure somebody's, no matter how I decide this, somebody is going to, and this is on the record, Somebody is going to take this up to the Ninth Circuit, and who knows, maybe one day it will end up before the Supreme Court because they're taking more copyright and trademark cases these days. <laughs> so there you go. There we are. Wow. We'll ask, him, we'll ask that judge what's going to happen. Uh, I, well, you may. I, I'm not sure he likes our client very much, but he's a very nice man. And I, my wife and I and my father-in-law all knew him for a very long time. Yeah, so I may I mean, ask him. One thing that jumps, I mean, judges are human and they react to cases, and they react to what they see. And my take is that this judge was offended by what he saw, and he found a way to rule accordingly. I mean, we cite in our amicus brief uh, a study by Barton Beebe of uh, the way the likelihood of confusion factors are applied across the circuits. And his conclusion was that it's essentially results oriented. First, they decide how the case ought to come out, and then they figure out how the factors are gonna apply. And I think that's what happened. This judge was offended by, I don't know whether he drinks Jack Daniels, but he was offended by association of Jack Daniels with manure or excrement or whatever you want to call it. Poop. 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 <laughs> okay. Well, um, this brings us to the end of our time. And I want to invite you all to uh, join us at the reception where you'll have a chance to talk privately um, with um, some of the speakers here tonight. Um, thank Thanks you so, so much for your attention for this this 90 minutes. It was intense. Um, and thanks so much to my guests, um, the speakers who uh, really, I think, uh, gave us a lot of insights about the case. So thank you all. Thank you.